Good morning. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of the Thinkers 50. I'd like to welcome you to a Thinkers 50 webinar. Uh, Thinkers 50, we've always believed there's nothing so practical as a great idea. And our emphasis on this bright Monday morning is on putting ideas into practice. Our guests are Carolyn Frankenberger and Marcus Schmidt, co-authors of a new book, which will be coming out on the 29th of September, published by Wiley. Uh, it's called The Digital Transformers Dilemma. So Carolyn and Marcus are two of the authors uh, of that new book. Carolyn is a former McKinsey consultant, and now she's director of the Institute of Management and Strategy at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Marcus has huge amount of practical experience uh, in transformation. He worked at Bosch on transformation there and the CEO and founder of QSID Digital Advisory. So the format today is very simple. Uh, Carolyn and Marcus are going to talk, show some slides, do some polls, let, share their ideas with you. Uh, during that time, feel free to send any questions and I will Mod, uh, mo I'll moderate. I will examine the questions as, as they come in, and then after about half an hour, we'll have time for Q and Q and A. Uh, so feel free to let us know where you're watching this webinar from. Uh, feel free to fire in questions at any time. Uh, Carolyn and Marcus, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Stuart, for yes. this introduction. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Happy to be with you this morning and talk about a fascinating topic of digital transformation. So let us, um, let me share the slides with you. One second. Okay, our topic for this morning is the digital transformers dilemma. It's a bit um, related to the innovators dilemma and we'll show you in a second why we picked this title. So the key message is really about how to energize your core business while building disruptive products and services. But before we start with the content, we would like to start with a quick poll to really see who is there and to better understand um, who is in our audience. So let's start with the first one. Which industries are represented today? If you could quickly pick the one that is most related to yours so that we can see who we are talking to. Okay, shall we go to the results? Okay, 34% are manufacturing, 23% education, and then we also have like advertising, healthcare, retailing, finance. Okay, so it suits perfectly the content that we are talking about. So let's go to the next one. Is the topic digital transformation on the top management agenda in your organization? That's a simple one, yes or no. Let's see the results. Okay, that's what I expected. Interestingly, that 18% say it's no. I even thought the number is higher. So, but for 82%, it is a key topic. And for the rest, it's still not on the top management agenda. Maybe we can discuss that at the end. And then let's move to the last one. How, how do you assess the progress of digital transformation in your company? Just roughly, what would you be your estimate between um, zero on 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and 75 to 100. Okay, that's what I expected, kind of. Um, most of you are still kind of feeling they are between 25 and 50%, 70, um, 37% still believe zero and 25, and there are only a few, like 6%, who think they are almost almost done with 75 to 100%. So thank you very much for those insights. That's super helpful because then we can um, customize a bit the content that we are talking about. So today we wanna to share with you a bit the insights of our research project. We are doing research for the last two years on this topic, the digital transformers dilemma. 
And the question of it is that we are often ask, okay, why another book on digital transformation? There are already so many books out. And to give you a bit of a context why we think this is a very important piece of research, um, we would like to give you some rough, um, a rough summary. So first of all, a lot of books that are out there are focusing very much on digitalization. So why is what do you need to do in order to act like a startup and be like agile and things like that? But what a lot of, or there are not many or even no book out there that really focuses on the dilemma for like established organizations. They already have a business and now they need to come up with a digital business. And this brings you kind of in a dilemma. And how do you manage this dilemma between the old world, the established world, and kind of this new agile startup thinking? And this is the key challenge that we kind of figured out that companies are facing. And this is what we try to research and try to give you some insights, some tools, some kind of how, how to guide, how to manage the dilemma between thriving in your core business and in parallel building up a new digital disruptive business. And it's kind of this innovative concept to manage the ambidexterity it's well structured, it's kind of really a how-to guide with a lot of examples. We interviewed 120 CDOs, CEOs and innovation experts and asked them about their success patterns or why they failed. So we had successful and unsuccessful cases and based on all the, these insights, we came up with a framework that we think is helpful for executives to master the transformation. It's also kind of a unique thing is that we really had a mixed team of authors and of course me coming from academia and then Marcus coming from the practitioner world and then our two other co-authors coming from the consulting world. So it's kind of this, and being younger generation we have kind of a really diversified author team and all this and, and the strong focus on, on companies with a legacy, which is really the focus of this book, which we think makes up something unique, a unique customer value that that is not there in the market yet. And maybe Marcus, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, just uh, you already mentioned uh, almost everything. I think uh, what is important also, we, we just uh, took the approach like a startup, developing in the beginning of the book uh, a minimum viable product, testing it with some potential readers and so on, getting feedback and adapting it. So. So also really using what we are recommending in uh, in our book also for our uh, value proposition. And I think it's also a book where you have some simple visualization of the concept and it's easy to use in practice. And I think we also wanted to contribute to bring a much more clear definition what is digital transformation in a world which is still, you know, somehow uh, digital is a buzzword and everybody has in his own definition. So to bring much more clarity into the discussion. And you can even see on the cover kind of those two businesses, kind of the blue one with the big ship is kind of the traditional business that you need to transform. And then the orange one with the drone is kind of the new business that you want to venture in. And how can you manage this dilemma? And this brings me to the next slide, which is kind of the core um, framework of this book. So we see it as two S curves. So we say the blue one is kind of your established business. That's where you're coming from. And you obviously need to energize the core. You need to digitalize the processes of your core business. You need to make sure that you use AI and all those different technologies in order to make your core business more efficient. And this um, allows you to move up on the, on the blue curve. But in parallel, we, we say it is very important that you start building up a new business, a fundamentally different business that helps you to master the future. And we say only because digital transformation is not sufficient if you only digitalize the processes. You obviously need to do that, but that's not sufficient. You also need to come up with a fundamentally new business model that can be done because of all the technologies that are out there. And this is somehow you need to think as a startup kind of within your established business. And having those two businesses then implemented kind of creates a dilemma because, yeah, there are different, and we come to that in a minute, there are different drivers that kind of lead to those businesses. This dilemma needs to be managed and needs to be embraced. So it's not something 
negative to think of, but something positive. And you just need to be aware of this dilemma and then handle this dilemma within your organization. And what is really important is written on the right hand side. So the success on both S curves is key for the long term survival. And that's what I mentioned at the beginning. A lot of books only focus on the orange one and say, okay, all incumbents need to move into a new space and need to do something different. But that's that's wrong. That's fundamentally wrong. So you also need to focus on the blue curve because you need the core business in order to finance the new business. You need the management skills from the core business. And therefore, the blue curve is as important as the orange curve. And that's the unique thing of the book that we really try to balance both businesses and in, in your entire thinking, how to manage your business, you always need to think about those both curves. So keep that framework in mind when we walk you through the other slides. Coming to the overall framework and maybe Marcus, do you want to explain that one? Yeah, so we, what, what we were looking at it was how to structure this book because it's a, such a comprehensive book on, on, on the whole digital transformation. And we, we ended up with the structure you can see here that in the beginning, we, uh, we will talk a little bit about the why, why to act. We come to this also in a few minutes. But then we come also to the what, what should be a digital strategy for the whole company, not only for the second S-curve, but first and second S-curve, business model innovation, and also the scope of innovation. Then the third part is the most important, is how to do it. Carol mentioned in the beginning that we really wanted to uh, uh, have a book where we very much focus on how to implement it. And in the implementation, we selected, I would say, three hard facts and three soft facts. Hard facts are organization, processes, and technology. The soft facts are leadership, uh, people, and also culture. And at the end of the book, we are also talking about the where, where to find the results. So how to measure somehow the uh, progress of the digital transformation. That's how we structured the book. Okay, now we would like to guide you through those um, four dimensions. And we want to start with the why to act. Yeah. So I will start why. So, I mean, the, the issue is really why to do a digital transformation and why to do it on both S-curves, as Caroline mentioned. So to do a digital transformation on your first S-curve, on your core business, to do it on your second S-curve, which is more the disruptive business, and how to ensure the coexistence of the two digital transformations in one overall transformation of the company. That is uh, what we are looking in, at the why, and um, why on the first S-curve, why on the second S-curve, and why to go for this dual business uh, uh, approach. If you just go to the next slide, I would like to talk to you about the different business drivers. You see on the left-hand side, business drivers for digitization on the first S-curve, and you can see the business drivers of the second S-curve uh, on the right-hand side. And both are somehow pushing, are driving your organization, your legacy business or your legacy company. Um, this is a little bit black and white, I agree. In reality, it's not as black and white, but somehow it's more black and white than many also executives would like to have or would like to, to accept. On the left-hand side, you can see on the first S-curve what is very important. This is still, of course, to increase your business excellence in the vertical, so vertical excellence, to increase efficiency, productivity with digitization, increase agility, flexibility, and so on. Of course, also on the first S-curve on your core business, introducing new design methods. You know probably quite well Scrum design thinking, but still, of course, the digital requirements will mainly come from your existing customers. You also have to think very much how to use new technologies like artificial intelligence in existing functions. And it's more, I would say, the private equity thinking or industrial investor thinking still. But it's very important that you go to somehow energize your core business, digitize your core business. And then it comes in addition to what is the second S-curve, the business drivers. And this is coming from, I would say, from the tech companies, from the uh, new digital companies. And this, they are creating new ecosystems, platform business, marketplace, online business, what I would call or we call the horizontal excellence, something you also have to consider. And this is driven by tech companies, startup companies, which come into your business quite often, even from other branches. You wouldn't even expect it. 
And this leads quite often to fundamental changes of the value chain. That's where you have to go for disruptive business model innovation, and not only sustainable innovation. That's where you have to look much more, not invent, not invented here syndrome, so to avoid it and to go for partnerships, open source. That's more the thinking of uh, uh, venture capital, where you need entrepreneurship and also to take risks. So these are really two business drivers, different, and they lead what Caroline mentioned also in the beginning to different success factors. So if you are working on the first S curve with these business drivers, you have to accept different success factors than if you are bis developing business on the second S curve with different business drivers. Okay, um, then let's move to the what. So what do you need to do in order to master the digital transformation? And here it's very important that in order to move on to the orange curve, you really need to fundamentally rethink your business. So you need to come up with new business models. So what we figured out is that business model innovations and not technologies determine the success or failure of transformations. Because the technologies are out there, so they they have been invented and developed and they are still in the process of being invented, but you can just take them. But then the, the challenging part is kind of how to, what do those technologies mean for my business? What does it mean in terms of new business models that I can come up with? And there the challenging part starts. And it's not necessarily about mastering the technologies, but knowing what is the impact of the technology on my business. And that's the, um, challenge you need to handle and you, you need to be sure about. So it's about business model innovation and what is a business model? We use typically this framework because it's very straightforward. You can say it's four dimensions that you need to think about. It's kind of what is my value proposition, the what, then the how, how is the value proposition created, then the value, so how is revenue created, and the who, so who is our target customer. So the who, what, how, value kind of defines a business model. And it's always important that you think about value creation and value capture. So how can I create new value for my customers? And how can I also capture parts of those value? And business model innovation means changing at least two of those four dimensions. So if you change the what and the how, then it's already a business model innovation. But if you would only change the what, then it's more a product innovation. So that's kind of a rule of thumb to make sure that you really um, tackle business model innovation and not only new products. And then what is the key challenge with business model innovation? A lot of companies struggle with coming up with innovative business models. And the key challenge that we observed in our research is that a lot of companies um, struggle in breaking the dominant logic because you have been in your industries for years and you kind of have done business in a way that it has been done for years. And the key challenge is really to do something different, to move out of your comfort zone and fundamentally rethink the way we do business. That's what a lot of startups do and why they kind of um, outcompete a lot of incumbents in established industries. And incumbents now need to do, need to do the same thing, kind of um, revolutionize their established business by coming up with an innovative business model. And what we came up with in our research, one of earlier research, but which is still really relevant, that there are kind of 55 basic patterns that you can just confront your own business model with in order to come up with truly novel business model ideas. So we figured out that all those fancy business model innovations that are out there, so the Apples and the Ubers and the Netflixes of this world, that they just use some of those 55 patterns and by doing that they reinvented the business model of their industries and this is what you can also do in order to reinvent your own business model you can just look up those 55 patterns and kind of think about what does that mean for my own business model so what would freemium mean for my manufacturing industry if you would just give away uh, the products for free and then would only charge after it is used for a certain time or something like that so and this really helps you to break out and to come up with fundamentally new business models. And then it's important to also bring that all together. Marcus, here you can take over again. 
Yeah, so on the, on the what, so the digital strategy, in addition to the business model innovation, which will bring you, especially on the second S-curve, to probably completely new business, you also have to do a good portfolio management of your innovation growth on the second S-curve. Probably most of you do already a professional uh, portfolio management on your first S-curve in your core business. However, to do it in the, uh, on the second S-curve, it's, I think, very much different. It's something you have to consider also in the early beginning of your new digital strategy of your company. That's why we believe you should, when you identify new business models or new business ideas, position these ideas somehow on the one hand, how new is a business model or how innovative is a business model, as, as Caroline mentioned before, and also what kind of new technologies, really new technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, blockchain, you are going to use. And if you combine these, then you have to position somehow your business ideas in the portfolio management. And that's a very important decision you have to take in the early beginning of your second S-curve. How much risk are you ready to take? If you don't take any risk, then your new business will be established business. Then you will remain on the first S-curve. So this is not enough by far. On the other hand, of course, if you go very much in the direction of disruptive, then it could be a huge opportunity. That's like what startups are doing, financed by venture capital. But this might also be a, a too high risk for your company. That's why you need a, a very important discussions in the early beginning, how much risk you, are, you want to take. But once you have, to take, you have taken this decision, how much you want to develop your second S-curve and, and which, which new business ideas, then you also have to decide how you want to organize it. So if you want uh, your own incubator accelerator, if you want to build up a digital lab, if you want to increase your network with the startup community, and you also have to really accept that you have a larger scope of disruptive innovations, which normally are still linked to your industrial strategy. This is also an important link between second and first S-curve. Your first S-curve is normally what defines your existing industrial strategy. And you have to make sure that in the beginning, you allocate also su sufficient people, budget resources, also for second S-curve. This happens quite often. People want to go for the second S-curve, but they don't allocate people. And then it will not happen. So this is in, in the defining of your what, of your digital strategy, very important, business model innovation, and also to define your scope of innovation. Mm -hmm. okay, so then you come to the third one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just the third one is now the how. We already mentioned the beginning. These are, I repeated, three uh, hard facts we identified as very important organization, processes, and technology. And two more soft facts leadership, culture, and people. And in each, each chapter of the how in the book, we describe also the dilemmas. So dilemmas, Caroline mentioned at the beginning, the dilemmas between first and second S-curve on organization, on people, etc. We will just share today because uh, lack of time, just one example out of the six is on leadership. Okay, so let's um, start with a small poll here to just understand a bit how you see it. What do you think, how many digital transformations um, fail during implementation? Okay, very good, yes, 70 to 80%. <laughs> yeah. So that's the right answer. So it, typically we say 70% for transformations per se, and for digital transformation, we even say the number is higher, so 84% fail. And then it obviously depends on the industry. So in some industries, like oil and gas, the number is even higher of the ones that fail. So you even end up with numbers of 96% or something like that. So, but we know it's very high and it has always been high. And this is something that, that, that triggered us. So why, why does this number need to be so high? Even if, if companies have great ideas about how, how to disrupt their business model, they still fail in doing that. So what are the main reasons, what do you think for the failure during the implementation? Is it insufficient resources? Is it resistance of employees? Is it top management does not support the change or other reasons?
So the majority says top management does not support the change. And the second most is the resistance of employees to change. And 16% say it's insufficient resources. So the result is it's not insufficient resources. So companies do have enough resources and budget. So this is seldom the case, but it's really the two other ones, the resistance of employees to change and top management does not support the change. And this is, they are equally strong in order to explain the failure during implementation. So this is what I said, what triggered us. And we did 120 interviews to better understand why are some companies um, succeeding in this implementation and why are so many companies failing in doing so. And as Marcus already said, we came up with those six dimensions. And the interesting thing is now really when we dig deeper into those dimensions, because the dimensions are very abstract and very, you would probably also come up with those dimensions. But the interesting thing is really the details and the little stories that we kind of um, researched and figured out what do those companies that really succeed, what do they different and why are they successful? And as you can see in all those six dimensions, you have this dilemma and you need to master this dilemma in order to be successful. And as Marcus said, we only focus on leadership today. So one of our um, interview partners said, for example, leadership, people, and culture really are the most crucial elements to tackle. They are more important than everything else. The rest is just process. And therefore, it really comes back to putting people in the center and making sure that we, um, as leaders, that we are able to um, engage, to motivate, to inspire our employees to tackle this transformation. Let, let me quickly explain you what is the challenge. So again, focusing on this double S curve, what's the dilemma when we focus on leadership? And on the right hand side, I put some questions that we, that we heard when we talked to all those interview partners. So one, for example, how do you reconcile two vastly different leadership schools of thought? Where the first one on the blue curve, it's more the transactional leader and the orange one, it's more the transformational leader. And in some cases, tran transactional leader always sounds a bit like, oh, that's the bad leader. But that's not necessarily true. Just remember the corona crisis now, where transactional leadership style was very effective because someone needed to take decisions. Someone needed to say, OK, what do we need to do now in this crisis? And then transactional leadership is, is really effective. Or if you have a large production site where you produce airbags or something like that, you don't want failure culture because if you have failure in airbag production, this costs life then down um, when your airbags are kind of in the cars. So in some cases, transactional leadership style is still something good, but the challenge is how to combine it and how to make sure that both styles can be vivid and can live in one organization. And then exactly the second one, what I already mentioned, how can you avoid the negative overtone of an old school, uncool first S curve and a new world cool kind of dichotomy? And this is what we heard a lot. Okay, yeah, the ones that were on the still working in the core business, yeah, we are kind of the old um, business and we just need to finance the ones that can do the cool stuff. And then you have the competition within an organization and how can you manage this competition in a very productive way? And then also, how can you reduce anxiety and fear of change for the first s curve leaders? Because this is also something that is often forgotten. Some of your core leaders on the first s curve, maybe they also fear this whole change. Maybe top managers also fear the change because they don't know how to behave in this new world, how to behave on the orange curve. And we, just one story here, we had like long interviews with the Daimler organization. Here they really mentioned that a couple of times they said, well, you know, our top managers, they don't know how to handle the orange curve. And they, they, they are kind of used to having their office and then having a meeting and then the secretary prints out a summary and someone comes into the office and then they exactly know what they need to do. But now in this new world, they are approached in the hallway and then someone of the younger colleagues ask them something and they are not prepared. They don't have the secretary who has printed out something. So they also have to fear how do they behave. Maybe then the younger co colleagues think, okay, he's not experienced enough. He's not knowledgeable enough. And how, how to deal with that? So these are all the challenges. And then how can you ensure the functioning exchange between the both S-curves? So having introduced you a bit into the challenge, I'll hand over to Marcus once again to 
dive, um, dive deeper into the leadership challenge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one, in my opinion, of the biggest challenge for all the legacy companies, that you need more and more leader, leaders or executives who have somehow uh, experiences on the first and second S-curve. And um, again, it's a little bit more black and white than the reality here, but also very much reflecting uh, my experience that you need different uh, competencies on the first and on the second S-curve, as already uh, Caroline mentioned. I think, and you need still both. Nothing is more, how to say, valuable than the other one, because it depends on the situation you are in your company, depends on the situation in which you are in, on your business, and sometimes you need much more uh, uh, experience and also focus on uh, leadership style, more transactional on the first S-curve, and sometimes you need much more uh, transformational leadership, like on the second S-curve. And uh, just some examples on the first S-curve is still, you need somehow on certain topics, clear decisions, strong execution. You still need to focus on productivity and efficiency to make your core business more competitive. Um, you, you need short-term actions, like during Corona, you, there was a lot of you know, cash management, you could only do in short-term measures. There was no long-term strategy and so on. You'd still need functional excellence. Don't forget it. It's not just, not everybody's a generalist. You need functional uh, people. And quite often you, you have restructuring and turnaround to do. I also had a lot to do, to do. In the future, there will still be a lot of restructuring to, to be implemented. And that's where you still need the executives who, who can do transactional leadership. On the, on the second S-curve, that's a little bit new for legacy companies. Um, that where you have much more to have creativity, you have to work in networks, not anymore in hierarchy. You have to much more focus on, on people, but also on social uh, innovation, on emo emotional intelligence. And you have also to accept what we call intelligent failures, 80-20 solutions, and not perfect solutions. You need on the first S-curve. And that's where you also develop your new and innovative business on the second S-curve. So again, it's very difficult to enough, have enough executives to, who already have experience on both S-curves and on both leadership styles. And um, in the, I'm in a, in a couple of board, boards where we have to decide on the assignment of C-level and CEOs. And we always have the big discussion, shall we rather prefer somebody who has long experience on the first S-curve or somebody on the second S-curve because there are still not enough people in the market who again have long experience on both S-curves. And that's something you have to be aware about. And if you are aware about it, you already discuss it differently. Then you can also make, for example, a C-level team where you have two people with strong experience on second S-curve, two people with strong experience on the first S-curve and they are somehow representing the perspective of the other one, and then you can work in a team much more successful. But if you're not aware about these differences between transactional and transformational leadership, you will fail. And then you will create two worlds, perhaps, which will never interact. And don't forget, when you start a business on the second S-curve, one day it will become the first S-curve because you are going to scale it. And when you mm -hmm. scale it, you will need functional excellence. You will need efficiency because then you don't have to deliver 50 prototypes, but 1 million a year. And then it's a complete different story. So even people on the second S-curve, one day will have to learn first S-curve competences and first S-curve leadership style. Okay, this was a quick overview of um, the content of the book. Here you see once again the summary, kind of the four dimensions, the why, the what, the how, and the where to see results, which we didn't cover that much now, but it's more about the, the measurement. And the, um, the first three ones are really the key, the main ones. And here we put again a bit the summary on the side, but we don't need to go through it now. I think I would rather use the time for Q&A. So let me wrap up here. Not everything that is ventured succeeds, but everything that succeeds was once there. So like this mouse who wants to get the cheese, and has now the right um, helmet to go for it. So hopefully we could give you some insights to go for the challenge of digital transformation and that you feel more competent to tackle that. So 
Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session now. I, I would just like to add one point, sorry Stuart, um, that yeah, uh, we believe very much that the COVID-19 crisis has much accelerated digital transformation. That's something we identify everywhere. On the first S-curve, that is very obvious what happened during the last um, few months, but also second S-curve digital transformation becomes much more relevant now after Corona or when we are heading towards a, what is called a new normal, whatever you, whatever it will be. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much, Car Carolyn. Uh, the questions have been coming in from uh, the people wa watching. A lot of questions about leadership. Leadership seems to be the thing that uh, ignited the most questions, because I, I suspect because it, it is the area where there are the, the most questions. Uh, what about the importance, instead of thinking of individual leaders, uh, John Dobbin, who's uh, watching, talks about the importance of teams, leadership teams, rather than individuals. Uh, I'll, 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 fire, I'll, I'll mention a few things that have, have come across on leadership. Uh, is there a need for a new role, a new leadership role to bridge the gap between the, the curves? Uh, which is another question that, that's come in, which I think is, which, which, which is interesting. Yeah, maybe we uh, just go, go ahead already. Or, so. Yeah, okay. I think, yes, there is a need for a new leadership role, especially a, a leader who is capable of handling both um, leadership styles, kind of who, is, who feels comfortable of leading kind of on the first S-curve, but also who is comfortable of leading on the second S-curve. And this is, there are not so many leaders around there who can really do that. So either you have leaders who feel comfortable of leading traditional businesses, or you have kind of all the startup guys who kind of feel comfortable of leading on the second S-curve. But there are only very few people who are capable of doing both. But ideally, you would have a person who is capable of doing both. And this is, if you don't have that, then you need to um, build those leaders within your organization. And there, what our research um, told us or tells us is that ideally, you would find someone of your organization with the experience, and then you can make sure that this person also gets the competencies of leading in the new world. Or then you have teams, as Marco said, that you can put together a team where you have those complementary competencies included so that they, as a team, can kind of capture both, both curves. Um, I, Marcus, I you want to? Yeah, I just uh, would like to add one point. I mean, uh, that's something I already mentioned before. We need these executives in the future um, who can really uh, on the one hand, do tran transactional leadership and transformational leadership. That is very difficult. That's very difficult because of experiences on the one hand, but it's also difficult. That's also my own experience is how to remain authentic as a leader if you have to move from first S-curve to second S-curve and back and that your people still consider you as a, yeah authentic personality because sometimes you have to take hard decisions based on failures and sometimes you welcome failures, for example. So it might seem to your people some, somehow strange at the beginning, but that's something you have to, to live. And this means leads to a very new role of executives. Only these executives who can manage this ambiguous dexterity between first and second S curve will be successful. And you, if you don't have them in the beginning, just again, I repeat it, do it with a good team, with a good team where you have a good understanding. The best thing in a team is, even if you have no experience on the second S-curve, you have somebody else in the team and you, from, as a first S-curve leader from experience, you know what is the perspective of your colleague and the other way around. And if you can then communicate this to your, your team, that this is, both are necessary, both leadership styles are necessary. If you can communicate this to the whole team also to your whole management team, then I think you will be very much recognized and uh, yeah, and your new leadership still will also be quite uh, uh, valuable. I mean, what you're talking about is an kind of ambidextrous organization, which has been written about elsewhere. So how, how does your approach differ, do you think, from the, amb the concept of the ambidextrous organization? I mean, what, what, what we just one first answer is that we identified in the how, how to do it, all the dilemmas, which is ambidexterity somehow, 
in the six points of organization processes, technology, leadership, people and culture. And I, I don't know any other book which did go so deep in the ambidexterity or the dilemma in how to do it. There are many books on the ambidexterity on a higher level, but I think we did a really deep dive in all uh, areas of implementation. And this is very helpful to, to somehow how to manage this ambidexterity in these different areas with a lot of examples and recommendations. Uh, Hans Meyer makes an interesting point uh, about the correlation between support or no support from, of, of management for transformation and the resistance of employees, the relationship between them. When you, when you polled, mm -hmm. the lack of support from management was the, the, the top one and the uh, lack of resistance from employees was the second one. But presumably the two are inextricably linked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They are interlinked. Yeah, was that the question or was? Yeah, 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 I think that's more an observation. They are, they are interlinked and surely the onus is on, 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 on management to, to, to solve that problem. Yeah, yes, they are interlinked for sure. So if top management is not supporting a change, then it's also difficult for employees to master the change and they probably then show more fear if if the leaders are not competent in navigating their company or their business unit through this transformation. So, and this is what really surprised me as well, I already mentioned it, but that a lot of leaders also show the fear because they think like in the old world, they need to show confidence, they need to know everything. But in the new world where everything changes from one day to the other, leaders cannot know everything. And this is something you have to admit as a leader to say, okay, I'm not capable of handling all the AI technologies. I'm not capable of understanding blockchain fully, but I trust, or I, I find a team who has those competencies. And I, as, as a leader, I'm rather kind of managing this team, but I'm not the one who knows most in the team. And this is something that a lot of more senior leaders struggle with because this is not what they are used to, kind of admitting that they don't know everything, but only if you do that, then you can show really leadership capabilities and then only then you can master the transformation. I think one, one, one important point is also this kind of business transformation on both S-curves cannot be managed anymore, only top-down. At the beginning, it's a kind of top-down. Of course, you need top management to, uh, to, 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 to accept and to push it. However, we have to work much more in networks. This means it's also a lot of bottom up. So people, also younger generation, will very much contribute to the transformation. And this means, and we discuss it quite often, that the middle management is of course also in a new uh, situation because it's not coming down from the top management, middle management to the people, but also people are pushing their middle management to transform. Uh, is, is there a sense, I always get this with uh, change and talk of change and transformation, that to some extent we're, we're fighting human nature. You, you talk about in, ingrained ways of working and thinking, but is, isn't that the nature of uh, humanity? What do you mean that we are struggling and kind of working well, together or changing? Yeah. Turkey, turkeys tend not to vote for, for Christmas uh, and people particularly... Uh, managers entrenched in ways of working and ways of thinking are unlikely champions of transformation in many cases. Mm. But, that, but that's, that's natural. Mm, yeah, I mean, you, I, I, my experience, you have both. You have, of course, these people who are scared and uh, they don't want to change, but you also have other people who, who can't wait until transformation will be done. And um, I mean, also during the COVID-19 crisis, you, you could see the difference. People who very much were uh, engaged in learning, in adapting, in becoming much more flexible, agile, and other people just waiting. And I think in a company, you have just to identify the people who, who don't want to wait for the transformation, who want to do it immediately, and somehow to integrate them into this change. So I, I, I wouldn't say, uh, everybody is, uh, is hesitating or is scared. You have both, but you, that is the leadership uh, also uh, task to identify the people in your company 
who want to change who, and who would even leave if you don't change. Yeah. I think it's also too easy to always say uh, people don't want to change and therefore the transformation is so difficult. So it's quite the contrary. I think people want to change, but it's the challenges that they, that they have the fear or anxiety of the change and therefore they need good leaders who take away the fear and the anxiety and show them the path forward and then change is, is doable and people actually want to change. Uh, you, you mentioned startups and uh, along the way, and there's a question from Dominic Bauman. What do you think about collaborations or the establishment establishment of startup hubs of corporations? For example, the Novartis Biome. Uh, what is the benefit of the company if employees work with startups, and what does it bring to the startup as well as money? So, I, I think there's always been a very interesting relationship yeah. between big corporations and, and, and startups and how they can use the, uh, the vigor and energy of startups internally and in positive ways. What, what's your view? Yeah, this is definitely something companies should do and we are very much supporting that companies go down that road, that they cooperate with startups because they can learn a lot from the startups and they can also um, get a lot of great new ideas and ways of working from the startup. So that makes definitely sense. So what we recommend to companies to ideally do both, work together with startups, but also try to create internal startups. To, to on the one hand side, if you have those internal startups, you can leverage your core technology and kind of use it in order to create the second S curve, which is not necessarily the case if you work with external startups who come up with their own ideas or their own technologies. And B, if you have those internal startups, you also kind of um, manage to have this culture change within your organization. Because the risk, if you only work with external startups, then this is still kind of something different. But what you also want is that you want to move your organization. And therefore, those internal startups give you more power to change the culture within the organization. But having said that, so absolutely, it's very important to also work together with external startups. And Marcus, I think you had both when you were working for Bosch, so maybe you can comment a bit on that. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, you, you as a corporate, or I would say legacy company, it's not only big corporates, even I would say medium-sized companies, family companies, you need a certain network with the startup community, because otherwise you will not learn the culture, how to build up a new business on the second S-curve. So don't speak about startups, but speak, speak with startups. This was one of my lessons learned. And the second one is then, if you want to build up the second S-curve, there's still the question how much you would like to invest in external startups in the beginning and for acquisition later, or how much, what Car Caroline mentioned, how much you would build up what is called corporate startups or corporate ventures, but still in the spirit of a startup. So if you don't know the spirit of a startup, you will not be able to build a successful corporate startup on your second S-curve. And um, yeah, that's where you, you, you can learn a lot. I, I, I personally learned 10 years ago a lot um, traveling to the different startup communities in Silicon Valley, Israel, and so on, because this was completely different compared to corporate. If, if you don't do it, and no people in your company will do it, you will not build up a successful business on the second S-curve. Okay, we've got a very interesting point from Rahul Bhaji, and he quotes Eli Goldratt. And here's the, here's the Eli Goldratt quote. Technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. So we need to see what limitations of the blue S-curve will be diminished by digitalization. That's a very good observation, not just... Yeah, I think I, re I understand in that way that technology itself, just because everyone uses technology, is not necessarily helpful. But you need to see how can I use technology in my organization to really create new value for my customers. And yeah, only I then you should then use the technology, not just because everyone else uses technology. And that's also important to really think through it before you go for it. So what is the new, and that brings us back to this what, so you really need to think about what is my overall strategy? What do I want to achieve? And how do I want to achieve that? And how can technology help me to achieve it? And not just using AI because everyone uses it, but how can it really create a new value, value for your customer that cannot be created without the technology? Another, another question that's come in, is it the relationship between the digital transformation function and the innovation function in an, organi in, in an organization? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, that is, it's, it's also a very important point because on the first S curve, traditionally, innovation was mainly done by research and development, R&D. And this was mainly in the sense also of Clayton Christensen, uh, sustainable innovation. So next generation product, minus 30% on costs, better quality and so on. Very important, still for the first S curve. On the second S curve, we believe very much innovation, disruptive innovation, it's not only done by R&D, it's more or less done by the whole company. Innovation can be somehow initiated by uh, innovation teams across the company. And it's much more driven by marketing, business model innovation and technology, and not only by engineering product innovation. So it's a big difference if you think about your innovation, especially innovation organization, innovation management, and also people doing innovation between doing only on the first S-curve or doing it on the first and second S-curve and in combination. You mentioned during the presentation ecosystems and their growing importance in, in organizations. Mm -hmm. And doesn't that make transformation more complex and demanding? Because ecosystems by their, their very nature are bring complexity and ambiguity and a, a myriad of different relationships. And they're not under the control of a, a single company and not under control of a single leader. Do, do ecosystems complicate things or do they cr create greater potential? I mean, uh, it's both kind of, or they, they're more complex, but they also create new potential. And to me, I see it, it's on the orange curve. So for us, the orange curve is kind of some new business model, but new business model, and Marcus mentioned that earlier, in partnerships, in collaborations with others. So for us, the orange curve can be um, equal with ecosystems, and it creates more potential, but obviously it's also complex because you need to work together with partners, you need to sort out who is the orchestrator in the ecosystem, what are the rules in the ecosystem, where are the boundaries of the ecosystems, etc. But these are all questions that need to be answered anyway when you think about new business models because the times are gone where you just do disruptive innovation on your own. So if you think about the orange S curve, it's necessarily together with partners and therefore we enter the world of ecosystems. And yes, it gives you more potential, but it also adds complexity, but that's part of the orange S curve. Yeah. And I mean, this is um, anyhow uh, a, a huge challenge for all companies, but especially also, I would say, for, for smaller companies, which are more specialized in one product, now to think more in ecosystems like smart home, smart mobility, smart building, smart uh, energy, and so on, where you have to think in a much, much larger scope, but only if you do it. That's why I'm or we are so much insisting on the second S curve for everybody, not only large corporates, to, to, to go into the new ecosystems because this will fundamentally or could fundamentally change your, your value chain. And so the product you are delivering today might not be needed anymore in a new ecosystem. And the new ecosystem, for example, Internet of Things, combines many data which was never combined before. That's why even if you don't go directly in a new platform, you have to understand what kind of new ecosystem or new platform or new marketplace could be invented and could fundamentally change also your first S-curve. So one, and we forgot it a little bit, or I forgot it in the beginning, one major argument also to go in second S-curve is also that you anticipate major changes on your first S-curve, which you would not be able to anticipate if you don't go for the second S-curve or for example, new ecosystems. Uh, a good question from Jao Fernandez, nice and simple. How do you unsilo the two S curves? Where to start? <laughs> so, how, how do you unsilo the two S curves? Yeah, that's a good question, Marcus. Do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a very good question because in the beginning of a transformation, and if you start at zero on the second S curve, you need a, a little bit of silo. That means because things are different on the second S curve, you have different uh, success factors and so on. So, so you need also different people. So automatically you will create silos. And then the issues of the, this is a very much uh, executive issue, leader issue we discussed before of ambidexterity. Then as a leader, you have to be aware that there will be two, two worlds in the beginning. 
but then you have to very in a very early stage to make sure that the two silos the two worlds are communicating uh, on a regular basis are exchanging and they uh, also somehow know to uh, to what the, the others are doing uh, uh, of important things for the company and if you are able somehow to create the two worlds and then to combine it and to recognize each other, then I'm quite sure you will not have two new silos in your organization, but you have only one big company with two different approaches on the first and second ESCO. But it's a big, big challenge. This is not for free. So maybe two more thoughts on that. So one thing that we saw is when the senior leaders of the orange and the blue S-curve, if they are very close to each other, then this helps a lot because if they are integrated, they know what the other ones do and then it kind of trickles down. Another nice example was from one of the companies we talked to that they created this internship possibility. So they created internships for the ones from the blue curve. They could go for three months working with the, with the colleagues on the orange curve and the other way around. And this created kind of this bonding between those curves and the understanding. And this was very powerful. I liked it very much. You mean, uh, what, what you have to avoid are these kind of biases. I, I have had this experience. People from the first S-curve are telling you, all the people on the second S-curve, they're just spending our money we, we are earning every day for nothing. And the people on the second S-curve tell you, all the people on the first S-curve, they don't know that in three years they will not sell their product anymore because they, there's no market or no business model. And this is something, these are uh, somehow you have to avoid and you have to manage. Isn't it, isn't it still astonishing that failure rates, the, the one thing everybody was agreed on, and we, we, you knew everybody would agree on it when you, when you put the, the poll, uh, how high are the failure rates? Every, everybody knows it's incred incredibly high, and it has been uh, for decades, well, since they started doing research into how, how many fail, which is astounding, really, given how much work has been done in, in this area. But I was left thinking, is that the way it's always going to be? Is that the nature of uh, transformation that failure rates will always be very high? Hopefully not. Now, when you when people read the book, then the oh yes, could be <laughs> down. I, I set that up so well, Carolyn, didn't I? Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart, can we do can we do the poll again in five years? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you but you think about all all the work. I mean, there's been serious minds. You think of. John Cotter at Harvard Business School and all the work he's done and many others on change and transformation. And yet the figures remain stubborn, amazingly high and depressingly high. Yeah, because it's a lot of hard work. It's not about this one concept that you need to understand and then you can handle it. It's a lot of hard work. So every day, every minute, every hour you talk to your employees, you need to take care of this transformation. It's, yeah, it's just a lot of work. And therefore I think a lot of companies just fail because they are not willing to invest so much work into yeah, all those leadership topics, culture topics, all the soft factors that are often neglected, but they are so important at the end in order to be successful. And what we've been talk about, talking about in the last hour, it applies to small and medium sized companies as well as large companies. I mean, I, 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 pre I presume it, it is largely applied to large companies. Marcus? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I, that's, that's also one of the uh, conclusion in, in this book. I mean, we did the 120 interviews Caroline mentioned. We did it with many different companies, different industries, but also size-wise. Uh, we had also a lot of family or medium-sized companies in, in our interviews and also based on our own experience. Uh, this is absolutely valid also for smaller companies, for family companies, but they perhaps to do, they have to do different approaches. For example, they might not have uh, the ability uh, to hire 10 people in data analytics or artificial intelligence and business model innovation. Then they have to go for more partnership and cooperation. This might be different, but they are also directly uh, uh, somehow uh, impacted by the second S-curve. So also they need to do it. Otherwise, there's a big risk that they might disappear uh, one day without knowing it before. We're running out of time. Uh, Marcus Schmidt, uh, 
Carolyn Frankenberger, authors of co-authors of The Digital Transformers Dilemma, which will be available from 29th of September, uh, published by John Wiley, uh, Essential Reading. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning and laying, laying out the very practical ideas in the Digital Transformers Dilemma. Uh, we have some more uh, webinars coming up from Thinkers 50. On the 15th of September, we'll have Gary Pisano and Alessandro Di Fiori. You can sign up for that at uh, thinkers50.com. And on the 30th of September, we'll have Gary Hamill. Uh, check out insighttoimpact.com for full details of that event. So, Marcus and Carolyn, thank you very much. And we look forward to the audience joining us for a future event. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Stuart. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you very much to the mm -hmm. audience. Bye. Bye-bye.